Okay. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the Kazakhstan American Corners program. My name is Hamajai and I'm the coordinator of the American Corner Kostanai and I will host of today's meeting. So let me also introduce my colleagues, Adelina, the coordinator of the American Corner Petropavlsk and Alfia, coordinator of the American Corner Karaganda. Thank you everyone for joining us. So let me briefly tell you who we are. American Corners are friendly and welcoming American style information and resource centers. We are open to the public and completely free of charge. Hosted in different institutions all over Kazakhstan, we provide access to high quality English language resources, conversation clubs, information about education in the United States, a large resource database, American books, movies, games, and more. You can easily connect with new friends, practice your English and learn about the United States. So today's session is dedicated to the Air Quality Awareness Week. The theme of Air Quality Awareness Week 2021 is healthy air important for everyone. You will learn about issues of air quality awareness, importance of checking the air quality index and how air pollution affects human health. We're excited to introduce to you a special guest, Justin Heng, the Regional Environment Science, Technology and Health Hub Officer for the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. He's based in the US Embassy in Al Sultan and covers Central Asia and Afghanistan. Today, Justin will talk in his presentation on the US engagement on air quality. So dear friends, before we start, here are some housekeeping rules. The session will be recorded. We disabled your mics, but you may ask your questions during the presentation by using the chat box below, or you can raise your virtual hand. You can find the button also below, and we will let you ask your questions. So after the Q&A session, I will kindly ask you to fill out a poll and we will close the session at 5 p.m. So now I give the floor to the Justin. Thank you very much, Kamajau. And uh, let me start by saying hello and welcome to the session. I'm very happy to be here. What I'll do now is I will share the screen and hopefully we can start with a presentation. So let's see. All right. If you just give me a couple of seconds, I will figure out how to <laughs> do this um, and do the full screen. So hold on a second. Let me see if I can get the full screen on this. All right, so hopefully everyone can see the uh, full screen. Let me know if it's not working. Uh, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Justin Hearn. I am the Regional Environment, Science, Technology and Health Officer for Central Asia. That's the five Central Asian countries plus Afghanistan. I cover, as I said before, environment, science, technology and health. And one of the priorities uh, within the environmental realm is air quality. The, uh, I'm a regional officer because I cover five countries plus Afghanistan, but uh, I'm based here in Nur Sultan at the US Embassy in Nur Sultan. So I'm gonna talk a couple of, uh, about a couple of different things during this presentation. So the first thing I'll talk about is just for those of you who are not aware, or not uh, very knowledgeable about it yet. What is air pollution? What do we consider air pollution is? The second thing is uh, talk a little bit about how air pollution globally is a US priority. 
The third thing we're going to talk about is a little bit about the US engagement, what we're doing in Kazakhstan in particular uh, to uh, address air pollution. And the final thing we're going to talk about uh, is me taking some of your questions, if you have any, uh, and hopefully providing some answers. So what is air pollution? Well, essentially air pollution, uh, the way we discuss it in the US government, it is particulate matter. And particulate matter is measured in micrometers. That's uh, one millionth of a meter. The most important air pollution particle sizes are PM10, which is known as coarse particulate matter, and PM2.5, which is known as fine particulate matter. PM2.5, which is uh, particles that are 2.5 micrometers or less in size, are of specific interest to us because of the health effects that it creates in humans. As you can see on the, on the picture on the right, you have what is, you can see that long strand, that is a piece of human hair. And five part particles of PM10 can fit within the width of a regular human hair. And then within each particle, another four PM2.5 particles can fit. So essentially 20 particles of PM2.5 can fit within the width of a human hair. Why it's so important to us is because when they get that small, when they get down to 2.5 micrometers or less, they, we can breathe them in. And not only can they reach to the very, very depths of our lungs, but they can pass through our lungs into our bloodstream and cause damage to our body. So there's been a number of studies that have come out recently that have basically told us that air pollution is becoming more and more important and it affects our health in many different ways. It is becoming recognized now that air pollution is now the number one risk factor for premature death. There, it is attributed to air pollution 4.1 million outdoor and 2.3 million indoor air deaths annually. And there is a difference between outdoor and indoor air. Uh, sometimes the causes of the air is different. For example, indoor air deaths are typically caused by um, the use of coal, charcoal to heat homes uh, and also to use for cooking and the, the use of inefficient or um, solid fuel burning uh, methods of cooking. So uh, back to the presentation, uh, the World Bank in 2016 noted that the health effects and other effects of health pollution don't just affect our health, but they also affect uh, our economy. It estimated that $5.1 trillion every single year are lost uh, due to air quality, poor air quality, either through the spread of disease or by a premature death. And actually, besides those people that actually die from poor air quality, um, it's widely recognized now that 90% of the global population breathes unhealthy air, especially in some of the larger cities in developing and uh, middle income countries. Air pollution is therefore a United States priority because of the global threat it, it creates towards human health, uh, towards the environment and also towards economic pro prosperity. It is now one of the top three uh, environmental priorities for the administration. I also wanted to let everybody know that besides being a US priority, uh, it's also beneficial for us, not just for our health, but also for our economy. I think you've probably heard, and a lot of people have said, that you can only have one thing or the other. You know, we can't have clean air because we need to have the factories, we need to have the power plants, we need to have the automobiles in order to uh, be able to have a, a prosperous economy and for people to have high incomes. Well, actually, our own experience in the United States shows that you can have both. It's not a question of having a good economy at the expense of clean air. And the example I wanted to show is this graph right here. Since 1970, US emissions have dropped by 70% while our gross domestic product, which is one of the measures of our economic prosperity, grew by 246%. So if you look at the purple line since 1970, that's the line of uh, particulate matter. And if you look at other lines, you can see the population, you can see vehicle miles traveled, 
you can see GDP have grown a lot more. So we now believe in the United States that our economic growth was not hindered by the fact that we took measures to improve our air quality. This is a little bit complicated. This chart is a little bit complicated, but I did want to show it to you. This is how we approach air quality. It's a couple different steps that are involved. And in more detail, if you look at each row, the first row is essentially collecting air quality data, uh, identifying uh, and establishing, uh, identifying the source of the emissions of poor air quality, if there is any poor air quality, and then establishing goals, standards, or guidelines, typically with public participation to determine, A, is it a priority we should address? And if so, what levels of air quality would we like to see? And then you get down to the next level, the green box, where you say, okay, we, this is what we're seeing. This is the air quality we have now. This is where we'd like to be. How do we get there? What type of policies, what type of programs do we need to put in place to achieve those targets? And then the third level of boxes is actually doing it, implementing the policies that we've, that we've developed and the fourth row, the bottom box, the blue box, is taking a look, taking a step back after you've implemented policies, asking yourself, did those policies work? Did those programs work? And if not, going ahead and making revisions. So this chart looks like a flow chart, but it's actually more like a circle. You're continually measuring air quality, developing ways to address it, and then figuring out whether or not those ways worked, and then starting all over again. So now that I've introduced how we uh, air quality and also how we address it, I wanted to talk to you about what we're doing about it, specifically, specifically in Kazakhstan. What we're doing about it, if you take a look at the little chart on the right hand corner again, is we're effectively focusing on that first row of boxes again. We're focusing on improving the collection of air quality data in Kazakhstan. And we're also focusing on raising awareness to allow civil society and government to set air quality goals. How have we done this? Well, we have implemented and installed air quality monitors since 2018. They're located at the US Embassy in Nur Sultan and also at the consulate in Almaty. And I did wanna note that Nur Sultan's air quality monitor was the first reference grade air monitor in Central Asia. What I mean by reference grade is that it's a monitor that has been certified to meet EPA standards and can be used to collect scientifically defensible air quality data. The next thing after we install the monitors, of course, is before we actually start to share with everybody what type of air quality data we're seeing, we kind of have to let everybody know, well, how are we measuring it? And you might have seen this chart before, but this is essentially the Environmental Protection Agency's Air Quality Index. It's an index that goes from zero to 500, zero being the best air quality, 500 being the worst, but I do wanna let you know it can go beyond 500, but the chart itself covers zero to 500. Uh, and then it's divided into six easy to read categories that are broken down by your sensitivity to air quality and what you should do at each level. So the darker the colors get, the worse the air quality gets, and the more you need to take actions to protect yourself against that poor air quality. Green and yellow is considered good or moderate, and then it goes down from there. You can see it's either un orange is unhealthy for those people who are sensitive to poor air quality, red is unhealthy for everybody pretty much, purple is unhealthy, it's very unhealthy for everybody, and brown is essentially hazardous for everybody. And you should basically stay inside, lock your windows, don't open them and don't go outside because if you do, there will be a health effect uh, that especially, and that health effect will, go, will uh, build up over time. Um, now that I've let you know how we report the data, we also share the data uh, publicly with everybody in Kazakhstan and beyond. The State Department's actually created an application that you could download on the Environmental Protection Agency's website, airnow.gov, or the international website, IQAir. It's called Zephair. It 
It's available either on Apple iOS or on Google Android, and you can download it and see air quality data from all of the US embassies and consulates worldwide. I think we're up to almost 70 monitors that you can check and you can check the air quality for nursal time, you can check the air quality for Almaty, and you can check the air quality to a number of other cities to compare nursal time air quality and Almaty air quality with air quality elsewhere. We've also started now that the air monitors have been with us and installed for two years, we've started to analyze the data that they've been producing. These monitors provide hour by hour data and we've gathered all that data, all those hours over the last two years and, and looked at whether or not there are any seasonal or temporal patterns. And you can see in Nursal Tan in this chart that there are patterns. Air quality is typically worse in the winter months during the heating season but even in the summer months, good air quality only occurs 60 to 70 percent of the time. If you want to look at the data from Almaty, it's even worse. You do have good air quality, maybe 70, 80 percent of the time in the summer. But in the winter months, it's only 20 or 30 percent of the time and, air, and dangerous or even hazardous, healthy, unhealthy, very unhealthy, or even hazardous levels of air quality occur quite often in the, in the depths of the winter months in December, November, January, and even February. The uh, US engagement that we focused on besides sharing data and starting to analyze it, we've also tried to reach out to publicize it and help the government. Publicize it amongst the public and also help the government. Some of the programs that we've participated in and we've funded have been an air quality management program with our partner, Move Green. Move Green is an educational and youth environmental organization based in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, but the program helps build an air quality monitor network in Kyrgyzstan and enhance the already existing network in Kazakhstan. We've also funded a number of different uh, panels and workshops to help government officials develop their air quality networks, manage their data, gather and manage their data, and also manage and improve their air quality uh, networks, ga data gathering, and data analysis systems. The other part of our engagements has focused on building awareness. We want to let the public know as well as you and the broader public, uh, civil society organizations, and even other government officials that don't work on air quality, how good or bad air quality is so that they can figure out, well, if it's bad, should we do something about it? And if so, how? So we've done it in a number of different ways. We're trying to share the information through programs with Eco Museum, for example, that they run different programs to raise public awareness. We've done talks such as these at American Corners, We've done Instagram series with various air quality experts. Um, that's the graph, that's the little picture on the right. And we've even helped journalists report in an objective and more scientifically defensible manner on air quality. Uh, that's basically our assistance to journalists to help investigative journalism, to help them understand what air quality issues are and help them report them in an objective manner, in a clear manner, in a concise manner to the public so that the public can also understand the issues that are at stake. So that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope you had uh, enough time to be able to absorb it and I hope I didn't go too fast so that you can understand it. If you have any questions, uh, I'm willing to answer them. And thank you again for your attention. Uh, thank you, Justin. So now I want to give the floor to the Alfia. Alfia, I saw that we have questions in the chat box. Yes, thank you, Kamajai. Um, I will quickly share my screen where you can see the questions. So, First one was, how can I recognize what kind of air pollution my city has? So that's a very good question, actually, because as I mentioned during my presentation, we only have two reference grade air monitors right now that the US government has installed in Kazakhstan. 
One is in Nur Sultan and one is in Almaty. So if your city is outside Nur Sultan or Almaty, you'll need to rely on air monitors or sensors that are produced by other sources. The good thing is there's quite a few. Kaz Hydromet, which is the, which is the um, Kazakhstani Hydro Meteorological Organization, has a network of 140 different monitors throughout Kazakhstan. And you can look on, and they even have an app as well that you can download, where you can look at the air quality that is at the sensor or at the monitor that is closest to you. If you also want to look at maybe not a government website or a government app, but you want to look at other environmental activists that have basically installed monitors of their own, there is an organization called aircast.org. They also have a website and an app that you can download. And they have a network of air quality monitors that can provide air quality statistics for cities that are, might be closer to yours if you're not in Nursal Town or Almaty. You just have to keep in mind that AirCAS right now, I believe, and uh, CAS Hydromet, they are, they probably re report their data, as far as I know, they report their data based on uh, air concentration. So the reporting is slightly different than the air quality index I mentioned in my, in my, in my, uh, in my presentation. The second part of your question also, I think, uh, is a good one because we, we are starting to have a network of monitors and sensors that tell us how bad or how good the air is, but it doesn't tell us what pollution the air, ha uh, what pollution there is in the air. Some of the sensors do that CAS Hydromet do does, uh, that CAS Hydromet has, they report different types of air pollution, but many of the sensors just give you the aggregate pollution levels. If you are in an area where you have sensors that just give you aggregate pollution levels, then what we need to do is we need to go to the next step. And the, if you remember the model that I showed you, the first step is collect the, collect the air pollution data. And the second step is try to figure out what's causing the air pollution through by figuring out what the sources are of the emissions. Those require, unfortunately, uh, some analysis some research to gather samples of air at these various places to do a chemical analysis of them to figure out what type of pollutants are in the air and what might be causing them. There are very, very good ways to do studies, but unfortunately, and the EPA has done some, uh, and I think there are a couple of researchers in Kazakhstan getting ready to do some, but they're very expensive and typically take uh, a long time to, to, to conduct. We're looking forward to seeing the results of some of those studies in Kazakhstan, because as you know, there's a lot of articles and a lot of report, a lot of media reports now talking about what they could be. Is it the power plant? Is it, is it, the, is it the, the buses? Is it the old trucks? Is it agricultural burning? Is it a combination of all those things? And there's a lot of media reporting now on, on, and even the government starting to give some sort of estimates on what it might be. But short of doing professional studies, we won't know exactly what's causing the pollution. Okay, nice. Thank you. Um, I see that Nurim has raised the hand. We will let you speak a bit later because we have to answer some more questions. So how can people improve air quality? Well, there's many different ways to, thank you for that question as well. Uh, there's many different ways to improve air quality. I think there are uh, some things to keep in mind, of course, are there are different actors that can, uh, that can act to improve air quality. We can all act together to improve air quality by choosing cleaner cars or riding bicycles or not burning our garbage um, not setting forest fires, you know, when you go out camping, you want to make sure that you make sure that the, the any fires that you set for barbecuing are put completely out so that you don't start a forest fire, which would then also create air quality problems. Those are things we can do at the individual and community level. But the government also has, and private, uh, and the private sector also have big roles to play. 
the government has a role to play in the power plants that it produces, that it um, that it constructs, for example, and whether or not it promotes the creation of highways that encourage driving or encourages more environmentally responsible modes of transport like bicycling, taking the train or taking the bus. Private sector also has a role to play in terms of the factories that it, that it builds and uh, other types of industries that it builds that might create a fair amount of air pollution. So there are a number of different ways to do to tackle the air problem, the air quality problem. And I think it's inherent upon all of us to work together to take individual community uh, and uh, group actions uh, and societal actions to improve air quality for the sake of our health and also for the sake of our country. Yes, that's true. Everyone can contribute. Yeah, so Alfia, so let uh, the rising hand talk. Uh, okay, yeah, no problem. Let him to stop sharing screen. Uh, my name is Saram, I'm from Kostanai. And I have a question. Maybe you already answered that um, uh, earlier, but I connected uh, like late. So um, we know that main problem in Almaty uh, is because of air quality problem in Almaty is because of cars and traffic. Uh, but I don't really understand what is the problem, for example, in uh, Astana, because um, mm, Maybe in Costa and I, we have the same problems, but we cannot like uh, detect them. And um, I want to connect the next question for this question, because uh, how like uh, people can improve the air quality by um, uh, doing something uh, during the day, uh, starting from using public transportation, uh, and so on, maybe some other um, hacks, <laughs> life hacks for improving air quality in, uh, in life. Well, Niram, thank you for that question. Um, it's a very interesting debate that's occurring in Almaty right now. I think there are a couple of studies that show that uh, transport is responsible for a large proportion of the air pollution in Almaty. But there's also studies that show that uh, industry and the power plants especially are responsible for pollution and anomaly. And the difference I think is, and this is something that hopefully what is what an emission study would be able to determine is to try to figure out the exact amounts that each source is contributing to the air problems that we're seeing. The study itself is called, uh, um, uh, it's a source attribution study. Uh, it's, uh, let's see, for some reason, the, um, a source apportionment study is, is the formal name of the study. Um, and hopefully the, if those studies get completed in cities like Nur Sultan, Almaty and other industrial cities, we'll be able to find out exactly what is contributing to what. But the debate I think in Almaty is, is that, yes, when you take all air pollutants as a, in terms of volume, and put them together, then transport is responsible for the majority of the pollution in Almaty. But my understanding is if you actually take the air pollutants that are causing particulate matter in Almaty and you take out things like carbon dioxide produced by transport, but don't necessarily make the air look dirty in Almaty, then there are other sources like the power plant pollution that then rises to the top in terms of its importance to creating air pollution in Almaty. The, uh, the second part of your question that you asked about Nur Sultan uh, is related to Almaty and other cities in, in, in Kazakhstan as well. Um, one of the reasons why cities in Kazakhstan experience such high levels of pollution is that the power plants are located very, very close to the cities themselves or even within the city's boundaries. And that's also the case in Nur Sultan. In Western Europe, in the United States, for example, we do have a lot of coal-fired power plants that are still producing electricity that create a lot of pollution, but they're in rural areas. So the plumes of smoke don't pollute uh, the air that city residents are breathing. So cities are significantly cleaner in the United States as a result. And that also means that in Kazakhstan, it should probably be a higher priority that 
uh, air power plants be retrofitted or remodeled to reduce their pollution because any benefit from those reductions will immediately accrue to all the people living in those big cities in Almaty and in Nur Sultan. Um, to answer the next part of your question, in Nur Sultan, pollution occurs in Nur Sultan um, mainly because, uh, as you know, I don't know if you know very well, Nur Sultan is, is quite windy. <laughs> and I've noticed that living here now for several months. It's almost always windy and it clears out the particulate matter very, very well. Uh, it, and while it's an Almaty, the wind speeds are much lower, so it allows uh, the uh, it allows particulate matter to accumulate and create bad, poor air quality conditions. What happens in Nur Sultan is that there are more days that the air is good, but the minute the winds die down, the accumulation happens very, very quickly. So during periods of high pressure where you have low wind speeds, Nur Sultan. Uh, particulate matter accumulates and Nur Sultan can have worse air quality than some of the most polluted cities in the world. And it happens very, very quickly. It happens within a, a matter of a couple of hours. And that's what some of the research that we've been reading has shown us is that the minute wind speeds die down, air quality in Nur Sultan gets very, very bad and very, very quickly. And if it happens during the winter when most of the units are, are being used not only for power generation, but also for heating, um, uh, then the, the, the air quality gets even worse. Uh, in terms of your last part of the question, I think I answered part of it already about what we can do to improve air quality. Uh, it's, I think it's a whole of society effort. It's what we choose to do as individuals by either what cars we buy, how much bicycling and walking we do, whether or not we use public transport. What we do as members of our businesses and civil society by uh, participating in civil society and being parts of groups that work on air quality or being employees that will demand to have your businesses that you work for also address air quality. It's what businesses themselves do when they work on air quality issues and then it's also the government. The government has to set the policy framework and the incentives to encourage people to make the right choices. And if they do so, if they don't, you can still make progress, but if they do so, it becomes much more easier to, uh, to achieve a lot more progress. Thank you. Oh, and I did wanna mention one more thing. Uh, the government did uh, introduce a new uh, environmental ecological code this year. They're in the process of implementing it. And if they do implement it, it looks like it should help address a number of different issues related to air quality. So they are doing something in case people were wondering. Okay, thank you, uh, Alfia. Please uh, continue to share the questions. Okay, yeah. So we've got some more questions. <laughs> okay. So. So could you please provide more detailed information on air quality monitors? We could not find any related information on the US Embassy website. Well, thank you for that question. There should be a brief uh, website page that introduces air quality in Nur Sultan and Almaty and then also, dis and also publishes the exact uh, live readings that uh, the monitors in Nur Sultan and Almaty are showing. So there, when we want to talk about air quality monitors, there are two different types of machinery that collect air quality data. The monitors are typically more expensive and more scientific, I guess, for the lack of a better word. They're more higher grade, they're ref you typically reference grade, they're more expensive, but they provide better data. Sensors are typically low cost. You can even sometimes buy them on amazon.com uh, or your uh, Kazakhstani equivalent. Maybe they cost a couple hundred dollars. They're not as accurate, but they can help still provide you with an overall idea of whether or not the air is bad or good. The reason why we chose monitors in, in uh, Nur Sultan and Almaty was because we wanted to make sure that we weren't sharing any bad data. And we wanted to make sure that we helped clarify the debate that was occurring about how bad the data was. We decided to take the best monitors that they were, some of the best monitors that there were, 
uh, make sure it was EPA certified and reference grade, which means that other monitors can be calibrated against these monitors to, 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 um, to verify their accuracy and then install them in their Sultan Anomaly. And their Sultan's uh, monitor has been installed since June, 2018. And Amity's monitor has been installed, I believe for almost a year. At least it's been reporting data for almost a year. It might've been installed earlier. These monitors, what they do is they collect samples of air over the course of an hour. And then that hour's worth of samples are then analyzed and then, uh, and then uh, fed through a, a, a calculation mechanism using software to develop and publish the air quality index on an hourly basis. Um, so uh, it's not real, real time. It's, a, it's up to an hour delayed, but it does provide almost real time data and we publish it on the website as well as through the, the apps and IQAir to make sure that it's available, that information is available worldwide. And I'm happy to say that even scientists are starting to use the data in their research. Okay, thank you. Next question, why air quality index is better in the warm season? It's, uh, it's better, but not perfect in the warm season because during the winter season, uh, I think both TETS2 and Amati and also the uh, combined heat and power plants in Nur Sultan, um, they, they, they become operational. Additional units in those plants come online and they produce even more pollution and therefore the pollution gets worse during the winter months. And unfortunately, those power plants and combined heat and, and, and power plants run on coal. Okay. So how can you find out what air we are breathing in smaller cities? I think I answered uh, parts of these questions earlier. Uh, if you're not in Nur Sultan and Almaty, you can look at aircars.org. That is a environmental organization that works in Kazakhstan and now also in uh, a little bit in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, they have their own network of air quality sensors distributed throughout Kazakhstan and are working on filling in gaps that they might have in their network in cities that are not yet covered. And then you may also look at CAS Hydromet. You can look at CAS Hydromet by looking at their main website and then clicking on, I believe there's a, there's a tab that, that deals with air quality. You click on that and it tells you not only uh, the overall con air quality conditions for the countries and which, uh, for the country and which cities are experiencing poor air quality and which ones are experiencing better air quality, but you can go to a city by city list uh, where they will show you the air quality readings for the city. And hopefully it's covered there. They're also expanding their network. So if you don't see anything in either CAS or uh, aircas.org or on CAS Hydromet's website, hopefully they'll be opening a monitor or sensor in your area soon. Okay, thank you. Is there any PM10 or PM2.5 in the forest? Yes, there can be. Uh, it depends on how close they are to sources of pollution uh, or, uh, and, and uh, we've been mostly focusing actually on uh, man-made sources of pollution. But if, as I mentioned just briefly before, if there are natural sources of pollution like volcanic eruptions or forest fires, then that will also produce particulate matter that would then be dangerous to human health. But if you're looking at a regulatively clear day far away from any human settlements and there's no forest fires or no other natural disasters, then generally it can go all the way down to zero. And the wind's not blowing and blowing in like dust from the Aral Sea or something like that. Yeah, then, then it can go down to almost zero. Okay. What is the main reason of air pollution in Kazakhstan? That I think we're trying to find out. I think there's been initial ideas, uh, media reports, government studies, trying to figure out, okay, is it, is it uh, transport? You know, should we be focusing on buses that meet higher Euro emission standards? Should we be renewing the vehicle fleets of companies or government to re remove the oldest cars? Should we increase emission standards for older cars and things like that? Lots and lots of, debate going on about whether or not it's transport 
whether or not it is uh, it is from power plants. But typically, power plants combined heating and power plants and heating plants, as well as transport, have been near the top of uh, of the most often cited sources for air pollution in Kazakhstan. But I did also want to mention one more source, and it's become a lot more serious in the previous decades, and that is salt and uh, fine sand from the uh, what was the Aral seabed being blown up uh, by prevailing winds and other winds, and then spread not only throughout Kazakhstan but throughout the region. It's uh, the extent to which countries, not only Kazakhstan but even neighboring countries, are being affected by salt and sand blown from the Aral Sea uh, is is quite astounding. And unfortunately, it's mostly due to desertification and the disappearance of that sea. Okay, next question. Uh, there, was what, there was a comment. US could uh, address the issue due to, the, due to strong scientific background. Could you please tell us about modeling since the complexity of the processes, weather, etc., emission levels don't direct correlate with this pollution? levels. No, I thank you for that question. Uh, and I agree that uh, we do have uh, uh, scientific expertise that we can share with Kazakhstan. Um, we have not some of the best universities in the world. I won't I won't say we have the best. We have some of the best universities in the world. And we have a lot of scientific expertise within our governmental agencies that we can share with Kazakhstan as it tries to address these issues associated with air quality. We have some programs that we run, for example, what we call an air quality fellow that's run out of the State Department. We're looking into seeing whether or not we can bring an air quality fellow either remotely, virtually due to coronavirus or physically to, the, to Kazakhstan to work on these issues and help uh, Kazakhstani organizations, local, regional and national governments and even the private sector maybe uh, to address some of these issues. It is very complex. Uh, there are Kazakhstani scientists that are starting to work on trying to figure out what the sources of pollution are, trying to figure out how much it's caused by natural and man-made factors, also trying to figure out how much weather creates or modifies pollution levels. So, but I think a lot of that requires data first before they can actually do the research. That's why we focused on getting the monitors in place to start producing that data so that researchers can say, can start using that data in some of their research. Okay, thank you. And next is definitely we have this problem in Kostanai. We have been monitoring it recently. Can closeness of industrial facilities in the south Ural Magdagorsk play in direct role in the air quality in Kostanai? Perhaps. Uh, this, this is also a good question. I, I, uh, I have to admit, I'm not too familiar with what type of industrial facilities there are in the South Urals, but there, there is a chance. It depends on, of course, what they're producing in those industrial facilities, what type of emissions are occurring, how high their smokestacks are, how strong the winds are in the direction of their winds, and uh, the types of emissions are important because if it's heavier a particular matter, it won't go as far. But if it's lighter uh, a particular matter that's, that's basically ejected further up into the atmosphere because the smokestacks are very high, then it will go further. Uh, and the only way to really find out, again, is to, to do some of those uh, source apportionment studies that I mentioned before. Okay. And the last question that we have here, uh, do you have any programs connected with water issues? Air pollution is an important thing, but what about water? Yes. So besides the Air Quality Fellow and uh, some other programs that we have, we do have water programs also. We have a program that we would need to consider, figure out whether or not it's important to uh, introduce in Kazakhstan. We're looking into it, but we haven't made a final decision. Uh, there is the Ambassador's Water, uh, Water Envoy Program, which could be uh, one way that we bring some expertise to Kazakhstan on issues of water. And uh, through our United States Agency for International Development, there are a number of different water programs that they're working on already. 
Uh, one of them you might have heard, it's called the Water and Vulnerable Environment Activity. It's a program that covers Central Asia and it started just uh, earlier, just late last year. It's a multi-year project and the idea is to try to promote uh, transnational boundary water management. As you know, uh, you, you might know that um, more than 50% of Kazakhstan's water comes from transboundary rivers. Transboundary rivers means that rivers that cross natural boundaries. So a lot of your water supply depends on the willingness of other countries to keep the water flowing in those rivers to reach you. Uh, and so in order to be able to make sure that you have enough water, you, it's, you know, it sounds pretty obvious without going into too much of the details that Kazakhstan would have to work closely with all its neighbors, upstream neighbors, on water management and water cooperation. Okay, thank you, Justin. So, this is two more questions. So, I will show it here one moment. And okay. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see the question? Yes, we can. From your perspective, to what extent does this code have similarity with this Clean Air Act introduced in the 1970s? Well, um, as you know, the Clean Air Act, I uh, think we basically attribute the Clean Air Act uh, as being one of the primary pieces of legislation that was introduced and adopted in the United States that helped us clear our air while at the same time allowing our economy to grow. Um, it's been modified since 1970, but that's one of the main pieces of legislation. It's what we call a landmark piece of legislation for how much it's done to help clear our air. And you, all you need to do is probably look at the internet, search on the internet for air pollution in Los Angeles or other types in other industrial cities in 1950 Pittsburgh, for example, 1950s and 1960s to show how bad air quality was in the US cities. And, and then you can compare them with air pollution now and it's still not great, but it's much better in a lot of those industrial cities. The eco code has similarities and differences with the Clean Air Act. I'm not an expert on the eco code because it's still being implemented in Kazakhstan. But my understanding is that it does look at various issues of the economy and tries to introduce best available technologies to address uh, emissions, climate change, environmental pollution, and other things. It, um, um, my understanding also is it has some pretty, uh, as long as they get implemented in the right way, it has some pretty good tenants. For example, before it was voluntary for various provinces to establish air quality standards and emissions goals. Now, every single province will, be, will have to um, establish air quality goals and standards and work towards achieving those goals. And any emissions permits that are being uh, issued within those provinces to build a new factory, to build a new plant or anything like that will need to be consistent with the goals that the province has established. So I just wanted to give you a couple of examples. It sounds like the code has a lot of potential. We're looking forward to seeing how the Kazakhstani government implements it. Um, and uh, and we'll, be, uh, we'll stand by and ready to assist the Kazakhstani government if they need any assistance in implementing the code. We can't promise we will, but we can definitely look into it and see if we have any resources available to assist them. Okay, thank you. I think it's the last question. How do you think are there any treats from other countries for our ecology? For example, China has a lot of factories. Thank you. Sure, uh, you know what? I did want to mention one quick thing from the previous question. Actually, we've already helped the Kazakhstani government a little bit with the eco code. Uh, we helped share some of our examples and we helped 
share some example text that they could incorporate into the eco code when they were drafting it in certain sections uh, based on our experience and based on what we've learned from our implementation of the Clean Air Act and other environmental uh, protection laws. So um, there, are some, there are some similarity, uh, there are also some differences, uh, but uh, we've helped where we could uh, we, and we look forward to helping more if necessary. Uh, so this question, um, Yes, there are threats from other countries, I guess, or challenges. Uh, as I mentioned before, on water, for example, there you will need to work pretty closely with the upstream countries to ensure that uh, water is shared in an equitable way, and that the and and that you, it doesn't result in significant shortages for any of any of the, your growing economies in the region. And, uh, and China is not excluded from that, right? Uh, some of your rivers actually start in the border of Mongolia and China. And so, and also there are rivers that start in Russia, for example, the Ural River, I believe, starts in Russia, ends in the Caspian Sea, I think. And uh, so um, there are lots of countries that are involved, not just with water, but also with air. And on Kazakhstan's side, and Uzbekistan side, what's happening with the Aral Sea are affecting other countries too because of the dispersion of salt and sands. Um, and then more global uh, patterns of air pollution, like pollution from Russia or Kazakhstan across the border from factories. Um, we'll really have to look and see uh, through this, through I guess the implementation of some of these studies uh, where the air pollution is coming from. So I don't want to guess right now, uh, but those are some examples. And I think it's the third comment, please share maybe the program about water. <laughs> Sure, sure. We can share. We can share about the program about water. I guess it depends on uh, what uh, Kazakhstan needs. Uh, we're already working with the um, with the uh, water and vulnerable environment activity. I think if you just go onto USA.gov's website, you can find out more about it. Just type in Wave, W A V E, on US, USA.gov website. If not, uh, reach out to the American Corners, and I'm sure. Uh, Either Alfia, Adelina, or, or uh, Kamaja will get in touch with me and I can provide them with materials. Thank you. So, uh, one more question How the EPA regulates new air pollutants? I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not an environmental protection agency uh, um, expert, but generally speaking, US regulation is based on risk. Uh, based on how much risk is involved in allowing a pollutant to be admitted versus the environmental uh, and environmental cost versus the economic benefit. So typically when we do regulate, reg regulatory promulgation in the United States, there will, there will have, there have to be studies that are undertaken to see whether or not there is a link between a certain pollutant and health. And then if there is, then there needs to be uh, then there needs to be some rulemaking procedures that go in place, for example, at the Environmental Protection Agency, that will then decide is this something that the Environmental Protection Agency has the authority to regulate, and is this something that the government should be regulating? If so, then they will come up with a draft law, uh, well, a draft regulation. Sorry, not a law, uh, a draft regulation that will try to address that, that uh, pollutant. But the draft regulation has to go through an evaluation procedure, as I mentioned before, where you're looking and saying, does it address the risk to health? And is it cost effective? It's known as a cost benefit analysis. Does the costs that the regulation imposes exceed the benefit that the regulation provides. If the cost exceeds the benefits, then typically the regulations don't go forward. If the benefits exceed the costs, then uh, there's a chance the regulations go forward. They're usually after the draft regulations put in, been drafted, then it has to go through a public comment period where industry, companies, citizens, environmental organizations, others can comment. They make some amendments and they put the regulation in place. 
But the whole thing starts with whether or not the EPA even, EPA even has authority to make the draft regulation. And that typically depends on, its, uh, on the laws that Congress passes that gives the EPA its authority. Uh, thank you, Justin. So, dear friends, maybe you have more questions. We can ask. We have a few minutes. So, also, uh, I want the participants. Uh, okay, we have one more question. So, I will read it. Uh, what are the best books about ecology? Air pollution, water, air. Actually, you know what? I'm going to have to pass on that question. I don't really have. I don't really maintain favorites lists and uh, that's probably not the answer you're looking for, but um, uh, I uh, um, don't really, I'm not really a favorites person. So I don't have favorite books or favorite actors or favorite movies or things like that. But what I usually do is I either go onto the internet and search reliable sources of information. And they also have, a, uh, I also have, um, subscribed to a number of different um, magazine subscriptions that provide me with information. I really like, I'm a little bit of a nerd, but I really, really like The Economist. The Economist is great because it doesn't just focus on economy, it focuses on all the related aspects of the economy, including the environment. And a fair number of articles in The Economist have uh, deal with science and technology. It's not just all about economics. There's a lot of articles in that magazine that deal with science and technology, the latest developments in science and technology. And they typically cover one issue in detail in each, in each issue, one area in detail in each issue of their magazine. So I really like The Economist. I'm also a member of a various different professional organizations. So I read those organizations uh, materials. For example, I'm a member of the American Planning Association. So I read a lot about what local and state governments are doing when it comes to planning, either planning their cities to be more environmentally sensitive or to be better to live in and things like that, or various rules when it comes to water management, when it comes to local level or even air quality management at the local level. So those would be two um, uh, publications that I typically read. Thank you, Justin. Uh, I want to remind to our participants. So dear friends, we want you to fill out the poll. We'll send this link in the comment section in the Zoom. So please feel we should know uh, your opinion about our program it will help us improve. It should take about a minute for your time to fill it. So uh, we have we have only two minutes. So we have many questions more. So I feel would you share or so okay. The question is: Can you tell about a gender specific aspect of air pollution? Yes, and actually that is one of the issues that I just mentioned the planning magazine It's one of the issues that are emerging and issues within planning and that is gender specific in, uh, impacts from from various uh, from various developments, including developments and 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 construction that uh, impacts air quality. What I did want to mention actually if I could i'm jumping a little bit all over the place uh, a book that actually I really like. Um, that's not completely about air pollution, but discusses the impact of urban growth on the environment is, is Crabgrass Frontier. Crab, Grass, Frontier. It's a great book because it tells you the history of American cities in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and how certain policies created the huge suburbanization and the huge flight from the central cities to new areas on the edge of cities and houses and things like that in the 50s and 60s throughout the United States and how policies enacted by the federal government played a central role in creating that suburbanization effect. And as we all know, um, suburbanization in cities, everybody having their own house where they have to heat their own house and they have to drive because it's not convenient to take public transport. It not only uses a lot of land, but it also has a significant environmental and logical impact. So that's an interesting book that I would recommend. Uh, 
reading that's a specific, specifically to the United States, but has parallels in other cities that are growing worldwide and suburbanizing worldwide. Um, gender, oh, I know it's five o'clock, so, uh, but I wanted to answer the gender question. Uh, that's an emerging area, as I mentioned in planning. Uh, what we've been finding when it comes to minorities, racial minorities, especially in the United States and gender is that there is an impact on air quality on gender, right? You have a specific impact, for example, on the health of pregnant women and how they can pass along air quality, poor air quality effects, health effects to their unborn children. And also when children are first born, and in their formative years from like zero to six, seven years old, they are also significantly, um, they're significantly uh, vulnerable to the effects of air, air pollution because their lungs are just forming. So there is a gender impact, it impacts people differently. Um, and we should, keep that in, uh, we should keep that in mind when we're developing our policies to address air pollution. So there is a comment with thank you for your time and interesting insights. So thank you, Justin, for your time and for sharing with us your presentation. And thank you all who participated in today's meeting. Uh, so dear friends, I remember you to fill out our poll also. Uh, you can follow the news of the American Corner on Instagram and Facebook pages. It also will send in the comments from the chat box. I want I think we should end our session. It was great and amazing. Thank you, everyone. And now let's uh, turn on our cameras and make screenshot for the memory with all of us who wants. Okay, here we go. Maybe more. Yes, please, guys. Yeah, don't be shy. Yeah, there is a comment. Justin is a great speaker. Yeah, I agree with it. Well, thank you. I, I thought I was just doing OK, but thank you very, very much for that. With that comment. I really, really enjoyed speaking to everybody today. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, I hope it wasn't too fast uh, for you and uh, or too slow. Uh, it was just right, perhaps, but uh, look forward to meeting some of you in the future once when cor coronavirus is over or in another virtual format at another American Corners event. Okay, I see a few guys who wanted to be on the screenshot. So I think we can do it. Okay, here we go. Smile. Thank you. Thank you, everyone with us today. See you soon and stay healthy. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Bye. Have a good day.